interpreter still on. I just got to upload these real quick. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Robert Dutton. This is my colleague, Scott Cruikshank. We uh, seem to have taken a slightly different tack based on the uh, previous example. What we're going to do is we're going to take our problem, show how it was solved classically, and then how FEM can be applied to it currently. Now, well, our problem is, of course, dimples on a golf ball. How did they get there? Click. Okay, golf ball dimples actually evolved organically over time. Golf balls originally were smooth spheres. It was noted anecdotally by golfers that over time, rougher golf balls flew farther. So, in the late 19th century, one of the preeminent physicists, Peter Guthrie Tate, no, you've never heard of him, but he did author a book with Lord Kelvin. You might have heard of Lord Kelvin. So, he was an extremely well-known physicist of his time. He was fascinated with golf. Two of his children were professional golfers. So, he actually wrote 13 papers on golf balls in flight. What he did is he took golf balls out, he took smooth golf balls out, he whacked them with a golf club, saw how far they flew. Then he took a file, and smacked the golf ball a few times, hit it again, see how far it flew. He discovered that if you whack a golf ball with a file a few times, it'll actually fly further. He could not explain this for a very good reason. Reynolds hadn't done his work yet. Reynolds was 20 years his junior, hadn't written his papers on fluid flow yet. So, that's pretty much how it started in the 19th century. And for the next 85 years. That's what they did. They took golf balls out, they whacked them with golf clubs, and they saw how far they flew. Every time, oh, don't click it yet. He's getting ahead of me. Now, some studies were done in wind tunnels, but the wind tunnels were done at low velocities below the turbulent flow limit. And that is, now by, this, by 1905, they knew about the work of Reynolds. They knew about transition from laminar to turbulent flow. So these guys knew what they were doing. They knew now why it was happening. But they didn't know exactly why the golf ball dimples were causing the ball to fly further, nor the best configuration for the dimples to make them fly further. Because every time they want to try a new dimple, what did they have to do? They had to make it in an experiment. They had to make a new golf ball, take out an experiment. That's a lot of work. All right. So we did. We do have a little experimental verification from the work they've done. You can see, compared to a smooth sphere. A golf ball translates, translates uh, transitions to turbulent flow at about one-tenth the speed. Why is that important? We all tend to think that a smooth object flies further, doesn't it? No, because the flow sticks to it, creating drag. When you transition to turbulent, the, the drag force on the ball is much lower. So what we did from this point is we actually wanted to validate this process that he just explained through FBA. Now, we use a program called SolidWorks, which we're all familiar with, but the add-on is called FlowWorks, which is just a uh, fluid analysis through SolidWorks. Now, this is a simplified mesh of the golf ball, and what we create is a, in this program, you create a domain that you actually want to solve the program, whether it be size of golf ball or if you actually want to do a space shuttle. You could actually create the, you create the domain, then you create the working fluid, and then in the... I wish I could show the uh, more advanced mesh, but it's actually so dense you really can't even see. It just looks like a black figure. But inside every one of these small, tiny cubes is the air molecules that would exist. And what it does is it passes iterations over that model, depending on how far you refine that mesh, and then gets the overall profile of the figure. So then you can actually calculate the velocity, the pressure, the drag coefficient, and any other parameter that you might be looking for. Um, this is the, in their validation, we did both a smooth sphere and then a dimples golf ball to show the difference in their velocity profile and pressure profile as well as the other parameters that I spoke of earlier. Um, in this presentation, I'll just mention the velocity and pressure. Uh, the velocity, you can clearly see the tail end, the turbulent flow. Um, I'll come over here. You can clearly see the turbulent flow. When you look at the smooth sphere, you can kind of see that it's 
kind of drag at the end of the spear is more narrow. Um, when you look at the actual golf ball, you can actually see it's just a more smooth profile. That's going to allow it to actually travel farther. You can click the next one. And then the more important is actually the pressure profile. Um, now, the explanation I'm about to say is a little hard to see in these pictures, but you want the overall pressure in the front to be closer to the pressure in the back. Now, when you look at these pictures, and I wish this presentation, the colors are a little off, but it's actually a darker yellow up front here, and when you actually look at the um, numerical data, the colors up at the front compared to the back, there's actually a greater difference compared to when you see this, because this actually, you can barely see, it goes all the way out here and has a lighter yellow color compared to this larger white blue. And the reason why you want those closer pressures is because when you have a negative pressure in the back, we all know that creates suction. And that's that extra drag that is actually causes the smooth sphere to travel slower. Therefore, that's why the actual golf ball, the dimple sphere, is able to travel farther. So we were able to validate using our experimental data that was found throughout centuries, now you being able to use FBA. And current industries create much more sophisticated models. I was just trying to prove the fact of dimples, but they all actually use dimple configurations, depths, and then the amount of dimples to actually get the best pressure profile, velocity profile, drag coefficient, and that's why you constantly see new technology being created. So now that Scott just stole my conclusion about why we use spam to model golf balls, it's because golf is a multi-billion dollar industry just in the state of Florida. Florida is $2 billion in wages are paid every year just to people who work in the golf industry. Golf balls, if you get a yard on a 300-yard shot and you get Tiger Woods to endorse your ball, you're a millionaire. Billionaire, possibly. So the ability to rapidly model these items without having to go to the cost and expense of molding, modeling, taking them out and whacking them with a golf club, be able to do it in a computer. How long did it take to model these, Scott? Maybe an hour or two. And that was on the computers we're forced to use here at the university. Yes. So you can see if you have a decent setup at home, you could probably go home and spend a few days modeling golf balls and they become a wealthy man. <clears throat> Any questions? Yes. Uh, with your results, would you uh, would you use certain balls for certain situations in the golf field, or do you think like well, the results are that drastic? I was looking at here. I mean, this is probably a good example. Of you do you play golf? Uh, no. Okay. Well, I mean, I play golf on occasion. When you actually go to a store, there's actually you can buy balls that have higher lip, higher spin, longer distance, based on and based on either the inner workings, like the actual materials it's made out of, but more importantly the actual dimples. The actual dimples will actually create or lift more air, which will create either more spin, or they'll be smaller, which you can see in this picture, that will actually cause it to go farther. So it honestly depends what you're looking for as a player. Okay. You know, if you want long game, you'll go for a ball that has usually smaller dimples because it doesn't create as much lift. So and you can actually test that in this program. And interestingly enough, the lift uh, your experience with spinning golf balls called the Magnus Effect, which was also discovered by Peter Guthrie Tate when researching golf balls. <laughs> okay, Mesh, for the ball, how did you um, or what did you use in terms of Mesh? The the program actually made it pretty simple. The, okay. Once you created the domain and the working fluid, it actually self generates that fem. That then it you count the amount of iterations you want and the procedure you want to solve, which, I mean, it's a very kind of, as SolidWorks is, if you all experience it, pretty much guides you to what you actually want to solve. So there wasn't a choice of what type of element to use, but it was just the domain and the type of okay. analysis. So the, the dimples that you created were then in the, in the uh, SolidWorks? The yes, job? it recognizes just, the model. You chose your uh, configuration for those dimples, right? Yes. So you could easily change that when you were trying to look at a different... And that's how I think, you know, I mean, I don't have the proprietary information of what industry currently does, but I think that's a similar tactic. They'll mm -hmm. test a little bit, you know, figure out, kind of test the configuration, test the size, test the amount, and then just continually work at it instead of going out, like he said, molding and then testing in real. Okay, thanks. Thank you.